why don't we get started? And we've got a lot of uh, information to cover today uh, with the sale, State of the Sales Tech Stack uh, research that was just recently concluded and we're sharing the results with you today. Today we have two incredible speakers. Oops, let me get to the slide. Mary Shea, VP of Global Innovation um, Evangelist at Outreach, and Mark McNaka, at President and Co-Founder of Lego. A Lego. I'm going to turn it over to you two to give your introductions. I don't think I can do your incredible backgrounds justice. So I'll turn it over to you first, Mary. Yeah, thanks, Marcella. Mark, it's great to be here with you today. And for everyone who doesn't know me, I'm uh, the head of evangelism here at Outreach. I have also spent many years at Forrester. Mark and I worked together back at the early days of the birth of the sales and enablement landscape. And so we've known each other for years. And, you know, day to day, I spend my time doing things like this, educating the market on the state of the sales technology marketplace, which is maturing and consolidating very, very quickly right now. I look at the future of buying and selling in the business world. And then I do a lot of work looking at diversity, equity, inclusion, and belonging, both in B2B selling organizations, as well as the sales technology space writ large. So um, happy to be here and actually thrilled to be sharing the digital stage with Mark. Likewise, Mary, it's so great to be here with you. And uh, for those of you who don't know, Mary was a central figure in really helping to define what I'm going to call the modern definition of sales enablement, which we're going to touch on a little bit in this call. Um, I'm delighted to be here as well. And in answer to your question, Mary, I like the way you put it. In terms of how I spend my time, uh, a big part of my time is working with our account executives and our account managers, spending time with customers. And I love getting to spend time with our customers because virtually every time we come together, we either develop a, a better understanding of the problems they're trying to solve. And in some cases, we discover new problems that we didn't know existed that actually need to be solved and can be solved. So similar to Mary, I also have a role in evangelism at Alego. And a big part of that is helping to educate the market about this coming together, this convergence of what's happening across the learning world, the content world, and the coaching world. And, and really, one of the things we'll be talking about today is the power of buyers thinking about a suite of tools that work together versus just buying individual point solutions for everything. And I think what you'll see here from the data is that the, as the market has matured, uh, people are coming to the realization that you, you can't have 25 tools in your tech stack because it's just overwhelming. So uh, delighted to be here, Marciela, and uh, let's do it. Thanks so much, Mark. First, I'm going to turn it over to Mary, who will uh, just talk a little bit more about the methodology, how we conducted this uh, research. Um, and so I will turn it over to you, Mary. Thanks so much. Well, you know, this is a, a topic I love um, very much. Uh, I'll keep it at a high level, but uh, towards the end of last year, we did a qualitative and quantitative uh, research project and surveyed just under a thousand reps, managers, and sales leaders to really get to the heart of how they were thinking about their sales tech stack. Um, how they were challenged with the changing dynamics between B2B buying and selling, and to really come up with what some of the core themes would be for 2023. And one of the words that I just keep hearing over and over again is efficiency. And so Mark and I will talk a little bit about that. But um, I think that's all you need to know for now. We did, as I said, quantitative uh, survey as well as qualitative interviews to get to the heart of what some of these trends are. And Mark and I are here to um, kind of react to the findings and really distill what that means for you at the individual level, organization level, and what you should do about it now today. Thank you so much. Okay, well, let's jump right into the first finding. Um, first key finding, I don't know if it's, you know, a surprise out there to anyone, but prospecting and deal management tools are the most widely used across teams. Now, during this uh, presentation, you'll see there's some slides here that we have uh, just to back up some of the supporting data here. But I'll turn it over to Mary and Mark um, to just give you more information, more insight than just presenting data. Yeah, I mean, as a former CRO, you can never have uh, a large enough or a high enough quality pipeline. And so uh, organizations and business leaders are really focused on creating pipeline, 
driving those opportunities as quickly and efficiently as possible through the cycle and closing mm -hmm. that pipeline. As we find ourselves in some pretty tough economic headwinds. And I don't know if anyone in, in the States today, we still uh, found that uh, growth over the last quarter was just under 3%. So there's still lots of debate around whether we're actually in a global economic downturn or not. But all the research that I've conducted shows that organizations are really prepping for a tough economic environment. So it's no surprise to me that uh, companies and business leaders are focused on prospecting and deal management and closing deals. And Mark, I'd love to know what you're seeing and hearing and, and how you react to this. Yeah, you know, I, I think that you're spot on. I think the fact that uh, there is the growth that has just been reported, um, it, it really gets to the point of, uh, on a technical level, whether or not the economic data represent a, a uh, recession. Um, what the Wall Street Journal reported today though, in a very interesting article, was that to some extent, it almost doesn't matter because the same mind virus that caused so many tech firms to hire almost with the sense of fear of missing out, like if we don't keep up with our competitor, um, we've got a problem, that even though the data is, as you just put it, now there's sort of this reciprocal unwinding of if our competitor is, is uh, lightening their employee load, maybe we need to do the same. So all that uh, being the backdrop, the bottom line is that prospecting obviously is the lifeblood of everyone's business. And you know, if you think about in any economic environment, particularly one where there's a, a belief of a downturn, whether it's it's technical or not, um, it's very easy to to think, well, we're going to have to turn the dial down on that. But to Mary's point, almost every CRO who studied history knows the last thing you want to do is cut prospecting when you're in a time like this. Um, and in fact, this, this may be the time to be turning up the heat in that particular regard. So the, the report actually goes into uh, much more detail about some of the specific uh, elements of that number. But I think at the highest level, I'm not surprised. Yeah, just two points I want to make, um, Mark, to dovetail off what you said. Most organizations that I talk with now, um, and my research shows the same thing, are really focused on growth from the install base, which, you know, when you're in a tough market, that can be um, somewhat easier than net new. So I do want to emphasize that prospecting, we always think about that in terms of net new logos, but it's really just driving growth wherever you can get it, whether that's from a net new logo or within um, your existing install base. The other thing that's worth noting here is that I thought sales enablement came out a little bit low. Now, this survey was done in September. What uh, I've I have done in the past, and I'm hearing from CROs that I talk to on a daily basis, is they are leaning in to uh, sales develop uh, sales training, um, sales coaching, sales readiness very heavily right now because of a couple of key things. One. The amount of time that a rep gets to influence that sale is now dwindling. It's narrowing because the buyer is doing so much on their own. So that's one reason. There's no opportunity for mishits, Mark. You've got to come in and you've got to hit your mark right on the point. The other thing is the um, environment is such that you can't go out and have over assignment on the rep side. When I was a CRO, I would over hire and I'd build in 15% over assignment. So I know that I could make my money and um, not miss numbers. Most organizations now are uh, working on less sales talent or the same talent. So you've got to drive better productivity and much better participation across the entire organization. And that means you've got to be Leaning in, leaning into upskilling, and I know, I know that's sort of near and dear to your heart, Mark. I don't want to, I don't want to spend too much time on one slide, but I don't know if you have have some thoughts um, as well here. Yeah, I'm gonna, I'm gonna uh, buckle your seatbelts, uh, folks, because um, we didn't get this through the sensors, but I'm gonna say it anyway. Uh, Mark Twain famously said that there's lies, there's damn lies, and there's statistics. And so the problem, even with this uh, statistic, despite the best efforts in the research hygiene that's involved here, is that sales enablement is a perfect example of a word whose definition has shifted. And frankly, it's even shifted in the last six months, right? And so why is that important? Um, 
just FYI, Marcella, yeah, this, I just want to make sure you know we, the screen shifted there. Um, the reason that's, that's important, Mary, in the context of uh, where it falls is because as this convergence happens between learning and content and coaching, what some people were thinking of as the world of sales enablement was more learning focused, kind of the upskilling you're describing, right? Some people thought think of sales enablement purely as marketing related content that's shared with end users or buyers, right? And then some of them are not exactly sure where coaching and CI fit. So I think as the definition gets clearer, uh, and you know, and this kind of data is repeated, it will likely uh, move up the list from where it is right now. Completely agree. I appreciate that. We do have a couple of questions in there. If you guys want to take a little break and just answer the first question, um, the data storage and reporting piece is interesting. Would love to know more of detail there. Is this driven by having too many tools with their own data silos and several ways to run reports? Yeah, I can jump in, Mark, and take a, a, a quick swag at this one. But look, I mean, no executive wants to be a systems integrator of their own tech stack. And the problem with too many tools, uh, amongst many other things, including the toggle tax, which I think we'll talk about, is that you've got disparate uh, silos of data. And anytime you're doing, um, you know, you're trying to bring together a lot of disparate data sets, you're opening up the opportunity for, um, errors, right? And for the machine learning algorithms that the engineers are building to derive really great insights uh, automatically for um, companies that use these solutions, you have to have a rich data set. So if your data is lacking, missing, or inaccurate, um, you're not going to be able to really drive the types of insights that it's going to take to make quick and great business decisions and to engage more um, effectively with your customers and prospects to understand where they are in the buying journey and to tailor that conversation in a way that makes sense for their persona, their industry, and where they are um, in terms of val- evaluating your uh, product or your service. That's great. Thank you, Mary. We also have another question. Maybe, Mark, uh, you might want to handle sure. this one. This is from yeah, Peter. Yeah, I can take this one. Mm-hmm. Okay. How yes, important sir. is clean data in CRM in order to deploy and realize immediate ROI from a sales enablement platform? So, Peter, great question. Um, I, I'm going to answer it this way. I think it's critically important that you have clean data, but I am also a realist. And I know I haven't been to any company, including my own, um, where I can tell you we have perfectly clean data. It's just the nature of the beast, you know? Um, so, I, I think a better way to maybe another way to think of it is um, if you could get to 80% accuracy within your CRM platform, how can you maximize your productivity rather than being completely focused on I got to be 100% accurate? And let me tell you why I don't think you actually have to be 100% accurate when you think of the resources, energy, and everything to keep it perfect. Because so much of what we're seeing is the best sellers creating a one-to-one experience. So if Mary Shea is my client, so long as I've got her information in, uh, in, in our case, in our CRM platform, which happens to be Salesforce, so long as I have that, that information, um, my ability as a rep to be able to, for example, create a DSR, a digital solution room for her, and be able to personalize an experience for her, I can do all of that even if it's not perfect. So the, the net result is in a perfect world, it would be perfect. We don't live in a perfect world. So I'm saying do everything you can to make it good, but don't let that be a reason. Don't don't let the uh, desire for uh, great get in the way of dealing with what you have now. Mary, over to you. Yeah, I'm just going to jump to the next question um, because I thought it was a good one. Are there tools that large sales teams use um, and are implementing to improve data hygiene? Well, that's what the whole category of revenue intelligence is about. It's about automatically capturing buyer and seller behavioral data across the entire revenue cycle and uh, shipping that data back to the system that you're using and then um, syncing with Salesforce or Dynamics or whatever your uh, CRM is. So the days of Salesforce Fridays are are over. Um, You don't have to bring in the ice cream truck or the pizza truck or the beer or whatever it is to get everyone to put accurate data in. You should be extracting that data automatically from 
um, tools that leverage uh, revenue intelligence capabilities. That's really great. Thank you so much. With that, we're going to jump to the next slide, our second finding. Tech stack consolidation is top of mind, but sales leaders don't want to lose any functionality. We saw that we had a lot of uh, leaders uh, choosing uh, how many tech stack, how many tools they have in their tech stack, um, but they didn't find any redundancy. Um, I'm going to comment, uh, turn it over to Mark first for for this finding for your reaction. Well, I think I, I would say the same thing, Marcella. In a sense, as I said before, I, I mean. Yeah, in a perfect world, it's it's like in any situation with any buyer. Um, if you think about it, if you were buying a car, there you you may have a list of things, and it's it's down to two cars, right? But at some point, something's got to give, right? That you're gonna you're gonna prioritize that one of these things is a must have, and one of these things is a nice to have. I'll, I'll give you an example. I was buying a car a number of years ago, and it happened to be a Jeep, and I was debating between a eight cylinder vehicle and a six-cylinder vehicle. The six-cylinder was less money and it got better gas mileage. I was just about to do the six-cylinder and this salesperson, who was a great salesperson, asked me one question. He said, the six-cylinder is absolutely fine, but I'll tell you right now, it's underpowered if you're trying to tow anything. Is there any chance that you might end up towing something you know, like a boat at any point in the future? And at that point, I didn't think that I would, and the difference was about $900. Bottom line is I got the eight cylinder vehicle. I spent the extra 900. And in my mind, I said, I paid a little more, almost like an insurance policy. You probably know where the story ends. Less than 30 days later, my wife and I were at a boat show, totally unexpected. Bang, we buy the boat. And the boat guy says to me, hey, do you have a vehicle that can tow a boat that's this size? And I told him what I have. And he's like, you're good. So that was a great example where you could do all the data and, and the collection as a buyer, as I did to the best of my ability, but sometimes you just don't know the right questions to ask when it's the first time buying something, whether it's a sales enablement platform, uh, revenue enablement, and any of the areas we're talking about. For most buyers, it's the first time they're buying it, so they're not going to know everything. Right. Yeah, thank you. Mary, did you uh, want to add on to that? Well, I just wanted to ask Mark when I was getting the invite to go out on the boat with you and your wife, because uh, I'm I'm kind of excited about that. But uh, I do have some 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 thing to add on to Mark's com uh, comment. Just so you know, Mary, we we have not only your seat, but we your your favorite drink from Spain oh, waiting for you. I love it. I love it. You know what my Mark knows what my favorite drink is? It's sangria. In case you haven't heard. Anyway, um, yeah, you you know this is really interesting. Like. You know, back in 2015, when 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 Mark and I and Yuchan and a lot of other folks were, were were trying to carve out the space and work together to create some of these new categories, it made a lot of sense to um, to experiment for companies to experiment with a range of point solutions. And most most of companies did that, and they tried to find who was that best of breed vendor, and so on and so forth. And as the sales technology marketplace has matured, which it has done over the last several years, we're now at a point where um, the providers like Alego and also um, Outreach and others, of course, have moved well beyond um, delivering a single solution to market, but now provide robust platforms that allow their customers to um, really have support across the entire revenue cycle. So there's really no need for companies to go out and try to architect best of breed single point solutions. I would go even hazard to say that many of the companies that are on the phone today, on the on the call today, probably have duplicative solutions in place or um, big gaps. And, and we could certainly help you think through some of that stuff. But to me, it's about really figuring out um, who is that vendor that I really want to invest in? Who is that provider that I really want to invest in? And, you know, is it outreach? Is it a Lego? Is it a combination of both? And make a bet on that vendor. Understand what their product roadmap looks like, what their philosophy is. Are they, are they doing more than just sort of turning on the buttons of the technology? Because we all know, you know, change management, education, and even, um, you know, just having that strategic executive who you can call if things are working or not working. So I think we'll start to see the number of tools narrow. And of course, there's less 
um, time waste of negotiating with a range of different vendors. And there's better uh, data integrity, which is increasingly becoming more and more important as you want to derive insights from uh, the tools that you have. <laughs> yeah, uh, Marcel. If I can, if I can just add to that. Uh, so, yeah. Mary, they all know it's sangria, by the way. I love so, it. I love so, it. So, we obviously have some. Yeah, I, 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 I'll be sharing my address later. So, uh, <laughs> uh, I, I will just say uh, there was a comment from Lisa and a comment from Kevin, and I, I absolutely agree. I mean, I, I think during this transitional phase. Um, there's going to be features you can turn on and there's absolutely going to be overlap between different vendors, right? And so the point Mary just made about the roadmap, I think there's there's a couple of elements there. It's not just about being able to understand what the roadmap is, but it's also being able to trust whether you believe in the management team's capabilities uh, to execute on that plan. And so largely, this is becoming something where you know, at the highest level, if you, th you think about Microsoft Office, um, I I'm someone who, like many people on this call, grew up using PowerPoint, and I grew up using Microsoft Word, and, and I know I can do it all for free in the Google suite. I can pay nothing, right? But I still like it. I like using PowerPoint, and I like using uh, Word, right? And so the question is, how much do you want to try to uh, incent me to stop doing something that I like doing or that works for me and force me down a path to go in a different direction? And in our case, like at, at Allegro anyway, you can do both, right? You can use the Google suite, you can use the, the Microsoft uh, 365, and, and certainly there's elements that overlap, but people tend to have preferences that they like one thing versus the other. So I think if you pull the lens back and you, you think about this uh, at kind of 30,000 foot level, the real question, as Kevin pointed out, is what are the core capabilities that are central to the problem that you're trying to solve? or the, the business opportunity you're trying to capitalize on. And then, and then recognize, does the roadmap help me imagine what are some of the future state things that we're going to need? You know, what a lot of people don't know, Mary, is that when uh, you have a, an iPhone and uh, you take a look at this, this keypad, right, this, that, this famous keypad, people don't know this. You see this little star button and this button that has the pound sign? Well, guess what? When they created that in 19, early 1960s, those buttons had no purpose. And, and for those of you who are old enough to remember this, in the old days on a payphone, you could hit those buttons. They didn't do anything, right? And it wasn't until later that they realized it was a genius move to build into the system something that in the future could take advantage of that. And I think the best platforms have that kind of thinking. They're, they're able to extrapolate to a certain extent what is it that we're going to need to be able to do? And how do we have, in effect, a, something we can activate to address that concern that we haven't even thought of yet? That's a really great story. That's really, really interesting. I have a question from William. Does it make sense to have a hub for your tech stack where everyone can go to access and interact with each piece? If so, what type of system works best for that? Sales content management, sales cadence, CRM? Mary, you want to start with that one? Start with that one. Uh, first, I'll just start with where you don't want your hub to be. And I'm sure there are people who will disagree with me. And maybe Benioff will be upset with me again today, but that's okay. <laughs> <laughs> He's got other fish to fry, Mary, right now. Don't worry about it. There's going on uh, anyway with, that, with all of that stuff. But um, look, I mean, I think the place where you don't want your hub to be is your CRM. Because... That was never designed for how go-to-market professionals work. The workflows don't make sense. The fields don't make sense. The user interface is clunky. And that's just across the board. It's not directed to one vendor or another. And I still, even to this day, do a lot of consulting with organizations that want to drive everybody to use CRM. CRM ultimately is a um, system of record to be used by back-end management to, um, you know, manage the, the flow of the business. Now, on the front end side, you've got to get something that's I call seller first technology. And that's why I always loved uh, sales readiness versus uh, LMS. Um, and that's a whole other topic, which probably is a can of worms. But what I love about sales readiness solutions is they were designed exclusively for sellers and how sellers need to have instant access to information and coaching and the ability to engage real time very, very successfully. So I think there are a couple of big, um, you know, platform solutions. You can go with your uh, readiness and content as a great landing spot and or your um, 
uh, system of activity like our sales execution platform at Outreach. We have uh, just done a pretty, not not recently, but a little ways ago, did a deep integration with Sixth Sense. So now, right in our platform, sellers get all of this dark funnel um, info and insights pumped in without even having to move around. So ultimately, you want Uh, It could be one platform or another, but it should be seller friendly and it should have the appropriate amount of deep integrations so that you don't waste time toggling back and forth between apps. You're um, getting some amens in the audience. so (laughs) That's always a good sign. Um, I wanted to skip back to a question that Xavier had. Uh, Where do you start if you want to modernize the tools you have if only old CRM? Well, give us a call. I mean, you know, <laughs> I think in a, in a weird way, that's sort of a kind of an interesting position, Mark, because a lot of the work that I do, I go in and, you know, there's 20 different types of apps and solutions and I got to go in and figure out and, you know, pull them apart and then tell companies how to prioritize. But, you know, I think if you're just starting with a CRM, you actually have the ability to leapfrog pretty quickly without having to deal with um, ripouts. And so the the biggest thing that I would focus on are is kind of like back to those areas where you your sellers need support across the entire cycle. So you've got to have the ability to access and deliver digital content very quickly to everyone that you're talking to across the revenue cycle. You need data and insights on how that content has been used. You need internal content that can help you prepare for every interaction that you have. And you need a type of uh, functionality that's going to allow you to manage effectively your omni-channel cadences and outreach across the entire uh, revenue cycle. And you need, you know, these deal rooms and and, and coaching across um, across the revenue cycle. So those are some quick thoughts, Mark. I don't know if you want to add. Or- well, yeah, I mean, I'll, I'll give you an example, Marciela. Um, at Allego, we also use outreach. Right, so it's a perfect example, as Mary describes the the omni channel. Um, I don't know that there's any one company that can do everything, and I don't even know strategically that that's a good idea. You know, I, I used the example of um, Microsoft a moment ago with some of those tools, um, but that doesn't mean that SharePoint, which was designed for a very specific purpose, is actually the place um, that most sellers want to go and access their information. In fact, more often than not, it's a dumping ground of all kinds of stuff and very hard to find things. So the beauty of this is there's no one company that I believe has the the bandwidth and the resources and the interest. That that last part is a big part of it to do it all. Mm -hmm. I would like to address a question uh, from Mark Stevens when he uh, asked about the the sales rooms. It's it's a great question. You know, he's asking, he says, it, it seems to be an emerging sales tech category but what percentage of enterprises are you seeing implementing sales rooms currently? Um, we've just done some additional research on this topic because at Allego, we've got uh, just an incredible DSR. And I, what I'm going to tell you is that the DSR is being used in different industries. So for example, we have some folks on this call from financial services. So I'm going to speak now in financial services for just a moment. They've taken what would have been called a digital sales room for a technology company, and they've converted it to what is now called a practice management portal, practice management portal. It's the same underlying technology. It's just that for these wealth management firms, what they need is a tool to help their advisors have access to the best ideas from all the partners they work with. And, and be able to share that content with their end user clients, which would be you know, like a customer in, in a technology company. So what I'm going to tell you, Mark, is this. With the exception of chat GPT, which is actually a big, even bigger trend, I have to admit, and it's unbelievable. I'm telling you that I think in 2023, your comment is exactly right. It's early stage for the digital solution rooms. It's really only two years old to speak of. But I personally have not only seen with people that I interact with. Um, I'm I'm not as technologically literate as Mary because I haven't come and spent as much time in the industry because I came from financial services before becoming a co-founder of a Lego. But I can tell you this, I can create my own DSR and I can do it quickly from a template. And I can personalize a short video to welcome people like I'm welcoming to my to my home. And the feedback that we are getting from 
end users, whether they're prospects. In some cases, we have a uh, an executive roundtable that I lead. We use a DSR, a private DSR in that case, in that context. I strongly believe that this is a trend that's going to continue to grow. And quite frankly, I had someone uh, at a training company. This particular person is also a professional speaker. He saw what we were doing, and his immediate idea was, do you know that when people are buying uh, training services and speakers, um, typically they're they're getting a link to a YouTube video. So he decided to use our template and be able to populate his sort of standard, this is his background, this is his bio, all the stuff that you would need to know, like a kit, and then just personalize the video for each one of the prospects. And what he told me was one of the people who just hired him said, when we looked at the other speakers, all they sent was a link to a YouTube video. You put it together in a package. It just seemed more professional. And it, and it was a very small difference between price and topic and all the other things they were considering. They went with this particular person whose name is Bruce. And uh, I think more and more that's going to happen across different industries. And people are going to realize in this competitive environment that Mary started talking about, um, it's going to be a, a, a very small thing that could be the edge. And something like a great DSR that you can execute quickly, that might end up being the edge. Thank you. Yeah, I appreciate that. I just want to remind everyone to change your chat from host and panelists to everyone if you have comments so everyone can see them. With that, I'm going to move on to our next, our third finding. Efficiency and rep productivity are driving forces. Mark, did you want to give a, a reaction first on this one? Well, I mean, I think you know Mary set the stage for it already, uh, and that was this notion that um, you're going to have to do more with less, right? That's just the reality of it. Um, and so, I, I'm I'm actually more interested in in the uh, the drivers of insight and integration. So let me pass it back to Mary. Do you have anything to add to the efficiency piece? Yeah, I mean, I I just I'll, I'll go out on a limb and say it's going to be the word for B two B sales for 2023. I mean, if it's not efficient. Uh, it, you know, people aren't going to be able to do it. So every organization that I talk to pretty much across a span of industries is looking at how do we get more productivity? How do we get more participation? How do we do more with less? And I think that's going to be across the board, not only with sales talent, um, but also with pipelines. And that's why you see solutions like, you know, Sixth Sense and others that can allow you to have, um, higher quality pipeline, we're not going to be having six, seven times coverage anymore. We're not going to be having over assignment on the sales side. We're going to have to actually get better um, and more accurate with everything that we do. Insight and integration, we've touched on this. Like, look, there is so much insights that can be generated from a robust data set. And to be able to lead with insights on the sales side will be a massive differentiator. Gartner has said for over the last year or so, that by 2025, you know, just about every seller is going to need to be insight driven seller. And so the way you're going to get those insights is from the data set and the machine learning algorithms that are going to give you um, all the information you need to know your customer or prospect before you've even had that first interaction. And that's expected now um, from, from uh, the customer base. Integration, we've touched on that. People do not want to have a whole disparate set of solutions. They want deep integrations with a few technology providers. And everybody's got to reduce costs across the board. And at the same time, find a way to continue to get that edge um, and differentiators with a value partner. Mark, did you? Mar Marcy, I don't have a lot to add. I think Mary summed it up beautifully. Um, that the net result is simply this: um, there's going to be continued consolidation, and there's no question there's going to be a cost advantage. We're seeing it already, um, but recognize that different companies have different contracts that are in place for different time periods. So it's not as simple as saying, oh, all of a sudden we're going to go mm -hmm. from using three tools tomorrow to using one, one tool that encompasses those three. It's, it's back to the earlier comment, you know, um, as one contract may come up, that may be the appropriate time to make a shift and then a certain feature gets turned on. So it, it really is going to require a, a more long term. And I think strategic and patient approach to be able to win the long game here. And, um, but, but the, 
end result of this is likely that we, we have a, a number of metaphors and examples from the past of how this story ends. And, and the way it ends is a smaller number of players who have a wide range of feature sets that can be activated as needed. And because of their scale, they can offer a much more compelling price than buying three-point solutions that do the same thing. Right. Thank you. I just wanted to flag a question from Daniel. Mark, what's your take on whether or not the market um, will be flooded with DSRs like video, Loom and Vidyard? Yeah, great. Uh, so I want to just um, offer to this entire group, thank you for the question, first of all, uh, Kevin. Uh, I'm sorry, it's Leslie. Um, and thank you for asking, because I'm sure you're not the only one. Um, my co-founder, Yu Chun Lee, and I actually wrote a book, uh, which is called Mastering Virtual Selling. And I'm not uh, here to plug the book as much as let you know, we're going to drop a um, a link in the follow-up here that Marcella is going to send. and And in the book, uh, what I can tell you is in chapter five, it, ex it, it really explains uh, the answer to your question. So first, the, the term DSR stands for either digital sales room. That was the original category name that, that some of the, um, the industry firms and analyst firms came up with. As I mentioned earlier, we have renamed that in certain industries because in financial services or med device, as an example, the medical device world, they don't want a sales room. That's, that's not the right term because that's not actually what it is. In many cases, it's much more of a, a buyer resource, right? In some cases in med device, they call it a, um, a clinical education portal. So think of it like a very easy to create. And I mean like two clicks from a template microsite to which I can send you either a private link that only you can access and the other people that I share on this private list or I send you a public link, which becomes more like a website, uh, a microsite. And the beauty of it is I can pick from a template and the template has an all nice marketing branding. And, you know, for example, in our world, we, we have one of our DSRs on what is a DSR. And so it, it has all of the relevant uh, analyst information and it has articles and has examples. Mm -hmm. And then it allows for you to have a short in, uh, video message. It can be a text message or a video message. It's usually more compelling with a video message where you're introducing yourself to the person or you're following up with the person and you're saying, hey, Mary, you had asked to learn more about this topic. If you look below me, I've put that piece of information. And then uh, you're getting all the data and all the analytics, Leslie. So that's the real power of this. It's, it, it's being able to have all of the stuff that you would have otherwise sent in an email put onto a microsite called the DSR. And... Um, if you don't know about it, it's definitely worth knowing more about. And I'm using this as a setup to answer the other question. And, and so the other question was, um, you know, do, do we think that DSRs is going to turn into one of those things where there's going to be a hundred of them on the market? Well, there might be, right? It's kind of like in a lot of other parts of technology there. It started off with box.com and Dropbox. And then before you know it, there was a uh, hundred different companies that had cloud-based storage. But there was really just only two or three who kind of nailed the whole thing, at least at the enterprise level. And I think what you're going to see with DSRs is unlike some of the companies that were mentioned in the chat, um, where it's just a video, kind of a prospecting video, that has its purpose under the category we talked about for prospecting. And, and it's certainly something that we've used heavily at, at Allego from the beginning. But much more important than that is this ability to curate and orchestrate content. And the reason we use this image in the book, this concept of orchestration, is McKinsey, the consulting firm, says that the ability for sellers to orchestrate the sales process, that capacity to curate the right content, sequence it at the right time, be able to stay engaged with a wide range of different constituents, that orchestration skill is perhaps the most important skill that sellers need going forward. So it's against that backdrop that I strongly believe this is going to be part of more and more of the, the sales process going forward. Um, and, and to the extent that your firm sees this and, and understands what the implications are, um, having one that's part of a bigger suite is likely going to be one of those comments or one of those points we were talking about earlier, if you buy just a point solution and you can't pull in the marketing content and you can't pull in the template and you can't 
quickly create a short form video. It doesn't make any sense if you have a point solution, you got to record something on your iPhone, email it to yourself or capture it and then suck it in and import it. Like you're not going to do that. It's got to be in one place in order for it to be easy. So Mary, as you can see, I get excited about this topic. Let me pass it back to you. I, I see you do. And I, the word that kind of comes to me is, is frictionless. Like if it's not frictionless for the rep or the buyer, nobody's going to do it in this environment. I think someone else mentioned, do we have any research that shows buyers want this type of um, ability to consume information? And so uh, I do have research that doesn't specifically focus on DSRs. It's a little bit narrow for the type of research I do. But what I see is buyers want to collaborate. They want to collaborate actively with you. They also demand personalization. Um, so, uh, the, the ability to personalize a video, and I could say that I've been on the other end of receiving a video from Mark and I just loved it. It's, it was informative. It pointed me to all the right stuff that I wanted to consume. I could, uh, go back and re-listen to it when I wanted to. And it put a smile, uh, on me, um, uh, on the day. So, um, I just think that customers are demanding this type of interaction. They want to collaborate. And then the other thing that's happening is you're seeing more and more buyers, uh, as part of the process, depending on what your sales motion looks like. But we're seeing many, many more folks involved in the process and being able to customize on top of a template is going to drive um, great personalization and great interaction for your buyers and give you as a seller efficiency. Thank you. Appreciate that. Mark, you did have a question from Mark, a follow-up. Are you able to share a link to an example of the a Lego DSR you talked about? Yeah, you it, should. It, you know what I'll, what I'll do is I'm just going to drop my email. Um, if, if that's all right, uh, Marcel, I, sure. I don't want to spam the rest of the group here, but I'll drop my email and anybody who wants that, um, actually make it really simple. If you want a copy of the book, um, I'll send you the PDF of the book and I'll send you the link to the DSR piece. If you don't even want to read the book, uh, it's about two pages that covers DSR, but we'll also send you the, the video on that. So let me, I'll put that in the email and whoever wants to know more about it, just drop me an email. Thank you. We appreciate that. Well, I want to just jump in. I see one question that might apply to me, Marcella. So Absolutely. where do you learn? Um, well, you know, coming from the analyst community, if you happen to have a, a, a license to Forrester, that's one of the best uh, research firms, independent research firms that really looks at sales tech deeply. Gartner tends to focus quite a bit more on the more evolved and um, more mature solutions. So I find they're a little bit late to the party on some of the things that we're talking about. But Forrester publishes a sales tech tide, I think every 24 months. Um, I wrote the one 24 months ago, and I believe Seth Mars and Anthony McPartland just published one. That's an amazing place to learn about these solutions. They come up with about 20 different categories. And many of these categories are going to converge over time, but they let you know uh, whether you should consider leaning in, leaning out, divesting, um, and you can learn a ton there. Also, you know, find your find your evangelist. Send Mark or me a uh, an email, or other people are out there who are evangelizing at tech companies. I do sales tech audits for our clients um, and prospects all the time, and. Mark and I, certainly we have a bias uh, to the, the firms that we are associated with, and we love the technology that those firms deliver to the market, but we can also pull back and take a higher level look at um, a range of tech and, and look at what you have and tell you, quite frankly, what, what you're missing in some of your tech stacks. I publish extensively on uh, this topic, and there are a range of other publications out there that can help you. So feel free to DM me, and I'll give you a list uh, of experts and uh, companies to follow. That's really great. Thank you both for sharing your information, for sharing your insights. I'm going to move on to the fourth and final finding. Winning teams use tech stacks that enable the full sales motion from creating to closing pipeline. We Mary, have why, don't you, why don't you tee that one up, Mary? Yeah. Mm -hmm. I'm going to start by uh, starting a little bit higher level. And um, I, I surveyed a bunch of CROs globally. And there are a couple things. They're seeing their budgets increase for uh, sales technologies, and they're starting to view innovative sales tech. And by that, I mean non-CRM uh, sales tech, but platforms like or suites like Allego and Outreach and others as a critical lever in their go-to-market strategy. And what they're also doing is also um, looking at diverting um, 
budgets from one area of the business over to sales tax. So look, I mean, you can't survive and thrive in today's buying environment unless you have efficiency that's driven by automation and effectiveness that's driven by insights that are derived from machine learning. You just can't survive. And I think at this point, and Mark, you may, you, you work with a lot of different industries as well. I'd love you to weigh in. I think CROs have gotten that message. Uh, business leaders have gotten that message. Board members have gotten that message. And they know you've got to have this stu- stuff. The one other thing my research showed is that um, sellers aren't going to go work at your company unless you have a top tier sales tech stack. 93% of sellers before they'll go work for you will evaluate and ask as part of the decision-making process what your stack is because they know that they can't thrive to the best of their ability and make all the money that they want to make unless they've got the right solutions in place. Mary, yeah, what I, what I would, that last part is absolutely resonant. Uh, as a matter of fact, I'll just give you a fun example of that. Uh, we have a bank that we're working with, and the the person who runs sales enablement told me this story. He said um, there were two recent hires. One of them was a top seller from another bank, and the other one was an average performer. The top seller demanded an iPad and demanded some other tech in order for him to be able to replicate sort of what uh, what he expected. And so this sales enablement person got a call that basically said, make sure this person gets the A technology. The average performer said nothing. And he got a two-year-old used Dell that had been refurbished. And when you think about that, um, it, it just sort of caused me to realize that by definition, so often the people that have the best tools have a natural advantage. And to the point Mary just made, the very best people, they know what they need and they're going to be asking for it. And so when you get used to using some of these tools and then you have to go backward It can be very hard. That's the first thing. The second thing I would tell you is that uh, for those of you on the call who are not from the tech space, and I know that we've got a a range of people now really from around the world on this call, I want to remind everybody that it's so easy to get caught up with the latest, greatest, I got to have everything that everybody else has right now. And what I what I know for a fact is that in industries like financial services, because of compliance, it's just harder to deploy some of these technologies. And so when Mary talked about doing the tech audit, it's not just a question objectively about which tech fits in the the gaps, if you will. It's also a question of culturally and within the industry you're in, what is the likely adoption curve for this technology? And so that's why in an example like the DSR, the Digital Solution Room, We have technology companies that are going to town. They're doing so many cool, innovative things. And what's happened is some of our financial services companies have said, well, we can't do all of that. But what we can do is have a much more locked down version that's really a one-to-one relationship between the uh, salesperson at an asset management or a wealth management firm and their respective client. So what I'm telling you is there's a way to adapt it within the culture that you're in, but that doesn't mean you have to be on the bleeding edge for all of these things, because there is this natural adoption curve that we see with all of these technologies, as well as the ones that came before. So the key is one step at a time, really figuring out what is most important, what's the problem that you're trying to solve, and then do you have the bandwidth, both from a resource standpoint and from an experience standpoint, on the team right now to help deploy the technology. Because frankly, you can have the best technology in the world, and if you don't have the right people to deploy it, it just doesn't matter. That's wonderful insight. Thank you so much. We have a little more than five minutes left. I'm going to stop sharing and add um, just a couple of questions that we had come in for our Q&A. First one is what are our what are the top five essential technologies a modern sales company has to have? Well, I can jump in there. Um, you know, even though I give CRM a hard time, I think we're still in a world where uh, companies do need to have a system of record. So CRM is certainly one. Um, as we've been talking about throughout this whole conversation, 
I think there's probably a couple of different things that you want to partner with, right? So you need a sales execution platform, which supports every member of the revenue organization from CRO to your post sell uh, to everyone using that solution. You also have a system that's got to pass with class reps to get internal and external content to um, deliver it in a highly interactive and personalized way and to drive data and insights from all of those interactions that happen over the course of that cycle. So I think it's less about a range of tools and figuring out, you know, who who are your strategic partners that are going to come together, sit on top of your CRM and support all the key activities that need to happen across the entire revenue cycle, making everyone more efficient and smarter in, in their internal and external interactions. Yes. Uh, I've, I'm in agreement. Um, and I don't know, Marcella, uh, it may have been my internet that cut out a little bit there. Was that last statement a little bit choppy for Mary, for you? It was too. Okay. Was. Okay. To so Mary, sure it was, yeah. th- there were so many people wanting to listen at that moment, Mary, apparently you're just freezing up the internet out in Palm Springs. So, uh, <laughs> um, but I'm just going to recap what I heard, uh, yeah. from Mary. And I, I, I think she absolutely nailed it, which is this, um, I, I you know, having, having a CRM, having a sales engagement, having sales enablement, like there, there's there's three or four that really are likely core to almost everyone on the call. But the truth is there's industry elements. Somebody asked earlier about a, a partner referral platform, right? So it depends on how much of your work is in the channel and how much of your work with partners. So it's it's not as much about here's the list, go check those boxes as it is around what is it that you're trying to accomplish at, uh, during that entire revenue cycle. And again, where do you have the resources to be able to support it? So I think um, these are great questions. I love engaging in this conversation, Mary, both with you and, and with the audience and, and Marciella. Um, welcome the chance to, to do this again. And um, I think, quite frankly, uh, it'll be real interesting to run this research again uh, sometime in 2023 and see just how much things have changed and Marcella, you may have to put the DSR on the list this time because I want to see if it uh, if it's changed in 2023. Absolutely, yeah. I see there's a lot of interest in the audience, so we'll be interested to see when we poll you all next next year what you have to say about it. Um, I appreciate everybody's time, um, Mark and Mary. Thank you so much for lending us your insights and your knowledge. Um, I want to thank everybody for attending today. Please be on the lookout for a replay of this. If you have any questions, feel free to. Either email directly Mark or Mary, send them Sales Hacker. We'll make sure that they'll get to the right people. Also, continue the conversation in the Sales Hacker community. You can go online, create a profile, start a thread, and keep this conversation going. So if you know of a tech tool that is changing your world, share it with the community. Um, Be on the lookout for the uh, replay of this in the email. And don't forget to email Mark. I know I am to get a PDF of the book. Thank you all for coming. Great. Thanks, Marciela. Thank you so much. Have a great day, everyone.